Good evening and thanks so much for joining us for our Sunday night service. I hope that you will take time to check out our morning series for Christmas entitled The Plotline of Scripture. Uh, this morning we dealt with the unfolding of God's plan in the Old Testament, dealt with some uh, difficult issues that some people have with uh, the actions of God in the Old Testament. Since we are in the Christmas season uh, at night as well right now, I'm going to interrupt our series through Acts sometimes this month to revisit some applicable Christmas themes for us as well that we find in, uh, in texts that are not part of my series right now, but just some texts that we're reminded of things, uh, truths that we reminded of as we look at them. And so tonight, I want to focus with you on an important part of life in our walk with Christ that we're reminded of through the Christmas story in relationship to two wonderful people that we'll read about in just a moment. And that important part that uh, we're reminded of here is the lesson of learning to wait in faith upon God. So our text for tonight is Luke 2, beginning in verse 21. The title is The Lesson of Waiting in the Story of Christmas. And you'll recognize the two people here as I read their names, a wonderful part of the Word of God. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had, conceived, uh, had given him before he was conceived. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Penuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshiped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law, they returned to, the, to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth, and the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this wonderful story in our Bibles about uh, Lord uh, Simeon and Anna. We pray now you just help us to learn uh, the lesson of waiting from just looking at their life. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. When we read this very famous passage in Luke, and this is one of the stories sometimes people point to as one of the, the favorite, I guess, in the, the, the Gospels related to the birth of Jesus and him being presented at the temple and they love the story of Simeon and Anna, and I do too. And when we read this very famous passage in Luke, we recall that it is not repeated in the other Gospels. Both of the central people here, Anna and Simeon, were apparently well, aged, and they seem to be people who've been in waiting for much of their life for the event we see taking place here in the temple with the infant Jesus. Verse 25 tells us that he was explicitly waiting on God. The text says there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. So he was explicitly waiting for Jesus to come. Verse 37 strongly implies 
that she too was in a mode of waiting on God because the text says about her that uh, she was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple but worshiped night and day, fasting and praying. And I think she's waiting there obviously as well. And so the story then reminds us that God is a God who utilizes waiting in his interactions with us, with the unfolding of his plan in the world and in our particular lives. So let's dig into this for a few moments tonight to see what we can learn as this is here in our text in the Christmas story. It's connected to a lot of other texts in relationship to this theme in the Bible. So let's look at it for just a few moments and see again what we can um, learn from it. First of all, we see the design of waiting. We see here that is elsewhere in the Word of God that waiting is sometimes part of God's design for our lives and for the world. And it truly is a pattern in the Word of God. So let me just remind all of us of a few other instances to demonstrate the point. So we can go back in the Old Testament. God called Abraham and promised him a son. But he made him wait 25 years before he fulfilled the promise in the birth of Isaac. God told Joseph that he was going to exalt him and use him. He then made him wait 12 years as a slave in prison before he brought it to pass. God told Israel through Abraham that he was going to give them the promised land. And he then made the nation wait 400 years before he fulfilled what he promised. David had to wait several years before he inherited the throne God had promised him. Children of Israel, remember, had to walk around the walls of Jericho for seven days before the walls fell and victory came. The prophets and the true servants of God in the Old Testament, they died waiting for the Messiah, waiting for Christmas to come and the new covenant to be unfolded. The writer of Hebrews put it this way, all these died in faith. They died waiting without receiving the promises, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. They trusted God in their waiting to the point of death. Jesus in his incarnation had to wait for his time to come. Remember that theme through the gospel. He had to wait for his time to come to make his identity clear and to die on the cross. And so we read in John chapter 7, uh, at uh, one point in his life, uh, in his ministry, he said, the world uh, cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that its deeds are evil. And they were going up to a feast and he was not going with them. So he said, go up to the feast yourselves. I do not go up to this feast because my time has not yet fully come. The creation itself and believers are pictured as well as being in a state of waiting right now for the new creation to come. As we read in Romans 8, uh, verses 22 through 25, where Paul talks about this idea of waiting. He says, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all, who hopes for what they already have. But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. And, you know, you can think of other examples. Uh, the Bible talks in, the, in Peter's epistles about uh, waiting for the Lord to come back, people mocking God's word being fulfilled. But Peter says that this will come true, that the Lord will act at the proper time and his judgment will fall. But right now we're in this period of waiting. And as I've read those scriptures, you perhaps have thought of other examples in the Bible or in church history of God causing his people to wait for his own reasons. And so, you know, I think we could certainly say this is a, a pattern in the Bible. Patterns point to purpose. Patterns point to design. These things are not random, and they play God-ordained roles in our lives and in the world. And so there is a purpose or purposes in waiting. It has a design, and so there are also then purposes if it has a design. So let me share next with you a few of the purposes we see in waiting. Why does God 
allow this? Why does God work in this way? Well, while the following are not exhaustive, I do believe they are core and central. And if we look for them, we can, can see this and apply it and help us get through things, help us wait. They're not random. Now, God has a purpose sometimes that is singular in relationship to our waiting. That is, he's trying to accomplish one specific thing. But sometimes God has multiple purposes in a situation in causing us to wait. So again, when we're having to wait, it is helpful to remember that we can trust God and recall what he might be doing. So what can we see that uh, God causing people to wait in Scripture may point to what uh, he might be doing? Uh, what is it for? Well, one thing we can say is that God sometimes causes us to wait to test our faith. You know, Simeon and Anna provide great examples of true people of faith. For many years, they faithfully went about their task. He was devout. She was a constant worshiper. They lived out two great principles which revealed that they truly loved God and rested in Him. They trusted and they remained obedient in the midst of their waiting. Listen, God values our faith in Him. He wants our faith in Him to grow. But He doesn't value it because He is some cosmic egotist. He values it because he has built it into the very economy of his relationship with us and what he's seeking to accomplish in our lives. And so when we fail to trust, you know, all sorts of havoc break loose, going all the way back to the fall when Adam and Eve failed to trust him. But when we do trust him, God moves mountains to advance his cause in time. So the Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please God. And he is pleased as we trust him in faith in our waiting. And through this waiting, he is growing our faith by exercising it, testing. When I say to test our faith, I'm not saying to test it to to hurt us or to in some way cause our faith to fail. We can always know he is not out to break our faith or to harm us, but he is growing us to trust him more and more as we wait. He's exercising our faith faith, testing our faith to grow it, and then we can rejoice when He comes through for us. God also makes us wait in order to purify us. In waiting, we see where our loyalties really lie when we have to trust God and wait. We learn where we are weak. We see things to which we need to die. We have to make decisions to say, I will handle this in this way as I'm waiting on God because I trust Him. And so I will keep doing this in obedience while I'm waiting because I trust Him. And that purifies our lives, purifies our motives, purifies, I think, even our love for God. I remember a friend telling me once when uh, she was going through a divorce and uh, lost a job, And she didn't know what all lay ahead, but she told me as her pastor, she said, you know, with what money I do have coming in, and I don't know how I'm going to make it, I'm going to continue to give and to tithe what the Lord gives to me. And she said that because she trusted the Lord and she was having to wait on him to work through a difficult situation And as she waited on the Lord in faithfulness and obeyed, she grew stronger in Christ. I'll never forget her telling me later what that did for her walk with the Lord, how this experience purified and deepened her love for Christ, deepened her trust in Him for the future things she would face in life. So God tests our faith to strengthen us and to, uh, or makes us wait to test our faith to strengthen us and to also to purify us and to purify our motives and and our perspectives. And then thirdly, God also causes us to wait sometimes to protect us or to protect others. Sometimes we need to be made to wait so that we don't take rash steps, which can cause more harm to us and to others in our lives. You remember in the book of Acts chapter 19, the apostle Paul had such courage and, and had no fear of going into difficult situations, and uh, he was out to share Christ. But you remember the city of Ephesus, as many people were turning to the Lord, the union or the guild that made the little uh, silver idols of the goddess 
their business went down and so they were basically the whole city was in a riot and they gathered into the amphitheater and you can read in this text in Acts 19 beginning in verse 29 as they are gathered there they're shouting great as Artemis of the Ephesians that was the goddess and says so soon the whole city was in an uproar the people seized Gaius and Aristarchus Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia and all of them rushed into the theater together. Paul wanted to appear before the crowd, but the disciples would not let him. They stopped him. They made him wait. Wait a minute, Paul. Even some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, excuse me, sent him a message begging him not to venture into the theater. You know, how many people have been protected from terrible decisions and consequences because God made them wait until they could see more clearly what they needed to do or more clearly what God was wanting to do or more clearly about how they need to handle a hard situation. That's one reason we historically have made people wait for a while before seeking or being granted a divorce. Waiting is sometimes very good to protect us from further Harm. And so right now, if you're going through a period where you just feel like everything stopped and God's not moving and you think there ought to be, you know, things should be moving forward more quickly, maybe God is protecting you in this time of waiting in your life. And then we also see that uh, God has a purpose in our waiting sometimes in that uh, He wants to shape events for our greatest benefit. You know, while Simeon and Anna had been waiting for a long time for the Lord to come through on His promise, we need to remember that God had been working and waiting much longer. He had worked over millennia, over time, to shape world events so that when Jesus came, there will be maximum impact. Paul put it this way in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, when he, he wrote this about Jesus, he says, but when the, when the set time had fully come, God waited until the time fully came to be ripe. And so he says again, when the set time had fully come, God sent his son born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. You know, we see God's wisdom in this and that when Jesus came into the world, the world was perfectly prepared for the gospel to spread like wildfire. It was prepared in a way that it had never been prepared before. And so people who write about this historically note that you had what was called the Roman peace. Uh, that is that uh, the Roman Empire was very strong and basically secure. And so uh, life was orderly in many ways, and people could go about their business and we could go about sharing the gospel. That's why Paul tells Christians in uh, Timothy, uh, where he tells Timothy about worship, that we're to pray for leaders and those in authority. So because God wants all men to be saved and, and wants things to be at peace, so the work can be done. And so that, that was there in a way in the world that it really had not been before in wide swaths of the human race. Then you had Lex Ramona, the Roman law, that helped the gospel spread because of uh, relationships with the Roman government to the Jews being a protected religion and Christianity is being seen as a part of that for a while. Paul, uh, drawn upon Roman law when he was about to be uh, persecuted. Remember, he's in one city and, and he got beaten and he said, you know, you whipped me as a Roman citizen and he made them apologize to him. So that gave more credibility to the gospel in that way. And then you had Roman roads. You had that wonderful road system throughout that empire that uh, for the military and for uh, goods to travel across and they maintained their roads well so that people could travel long distances and to carry the gospel. And the world was prepared in that way. And then another thing was in Judaism. Judaism had been dispersed, the Jew Jewish diaspora throughout the Roman Empire. And wherever the Jews went, well, they built synagogues when they had enough people. They taught monotheism. They taught uh, morality. And that was interesting 
in that time in the Roman Empire and the Greek background as the gods were losing their authority with the people and even their philosophers were getting more and more interested in monotheism in their writings. And so all of that played into the gospel being able to spread. Remember when Paul would go and do his missionary work in the Roman Empire in Asia Minor, he would go first to the synagogue and there he would find Jews and there he would find God-fearing Gentiles who had come to believe in one God and the law that to which the Old Testament pointed. And it was a great point of contact at that point to be able to talk about Jesus. And so that again helped the gospel to spread quickly throughout the Roman Empire. So God causes us to wait to fulfill things perfectly with his perfect desire and design. So things come together in the best way. I remember in my first pastorate, I went there when I was 26 years of age. I've been married three years, had no children, and um, was a good pastorate, had some tough times about three or four years in as we grew, and uh, there was a power struggle between some of the ones who had planted the church, mainly older people that planted the church, and the new people coming into the church. And it got very tough there for a while, and I wanted to leave. Uh, we started having children, and I was ready to move on, thinking about going back to school. Uh, and so I was praying and seeking the Lord. And I think this is a, a, a very acceptable way to do that. If you're sincerely reading your Bible through the scripture, praying devotionally to the Lord, asking for God to lay things upon your heart to help you understand what you need to do. I believe that God sometimes will speak specifically to you through scripture that he will just bring to bear upon your heart and to impress it upon you that this is what I'm seeking to tell you in this situation. And so I was wanting to leave and God kept saying no two times. He specifically told me to wait through two passages of scripture. So at one point I was ready, you know, to go. And so I, I prayed and I was reading at that point in the book of Acts where Paul was in Corinth and he said he was facing a lot of opposition, but God told him to keep on preaching there. He says, because I have many people in this city and the scripture, and he didn't have them then, they were going to be saved. But the scripture says that Paul settled down among them and continued to preach the word of God for a year and a half. So I, I didn't ask God again for a year and a half. I settled down. He spoke to my heart. And that year and a half went by, and I began to have that sense again, all right, I'm ready to go. I'm beginning to feel like I've come down to the kind of the end of what I need to be doing here. I'm in my early 30s, is it time to go do this? And so I began to seek the Lord again about that particular matter. And this time out of the Gospel of Luke, where Jesus talked about digging around the plant for another year and then see if it bears fruit. God just, he just hammered me with that text as I was in my devotion, seeking him about that. Uh, dig around it, like, wait a year, dig around it, see if it bears fruit. And I knew God was speaking to me at that point. And so I had to wait another year. But then after that year, I prayed and God began to impress upon my heart. I began to make preparations and boom, doors began to open for me to pursue my education, to pastor in another place. And that led providentially to a time and transition at the seminary, which would not have been there those years prior, but it was a transition time in 1994 in leadership with the birth of a new school uh, with uh, Billy Graham's name uh, at the head of it. And, uh, and it was just providential that when I went there, that everything in the, uh, in the, the landscape of the school uh, played into what God wanted to do in my life. And it proved to be a, a season that's very important in my life and my past, even where I am standing here right now tonight, in that uh, I ended up teaching seven years there in one of our seminaries. I felt God wanted us to do that. He brought all that together. And I just know had I gone earlier, none of that would have taken place in my life. And I probably would not have ended up here because that was the bridge that ended up with me becoming pastor here at this church almost 17 years ago. And so as we think about waiting, God causes us to wait because he wants to arrange things in the perfect way in our lives, the best way for us, because he's always working for our good.
And then that brings us to the final point tonight. The end of the second point kind of bleeds into this one. But that is, there's also, as we wait, the reward in waiting. As the old saying goes, good things come to those who wait. There is a prize sometimes, even as you're going through it, and also at the end, like there was for Simeon and Anna. Now, one part of that is that uh, we get to participate in his work and we get to see the hand of the Lord. Uh, Simeon and Anna, you know, they were praying. And God uses our prayers as part of what he's doing. So the reward was that they are praying for the coming of the Messiah with the promise that God told us, I mean, you're not going to die until you get to see this. So he knew, he knew the Lord was, was working. It was going to happen. And so they prayed and they're a part of that. And then they get to announce his birth and say things about Jesus that you and I are reading here even tonight. And they testify to being able to see God in action. And they were able to rejoice and to die rejoicing in their heart. You know, even those people in Hebrews, those Old Testament people looking and, and they were waiting and it didn't come to pass for them. They, they died in faith. They died in joy because they knew God would fulfill what he was going to do. And so when we learn to wait on God, it leads then to a moment of the display of his glory and we can praise him. There's the reward in that. Sometimes, you know, that proves to be one significant event in the world that marks the world for all time, marks our life. Sort of like the woman in the Bible, we remember, who anointed Jesus and uh, near his time of death. And the disciples, they were rebuking her for that and the waste of the money. And, and Jesus said, no, no, this, this act, he said, is going to be told over and over again down through time, what she did for me. And for that sake, she would be remembered in the animals, annals of history and in eternity. And so we remember her here, even as I've just mentioned her, that one big thing she's known for in bringing glory to God. And sometimes the reward is that one, one thing, that one moment God really wants to to use us. And this can be illustrated, you know, in nature with a, a plant called the talipot palm, which is a native plant of southern India and Sri Lanka. And this plant can grow to enormous heights in its lifetime, as high as 82 feet. And when in bloom, it grows even taller with a stalk of 20 to 26 feet, which produces smaller branches carrying millions of flowers. The plant, however, is monocarpic, which means it blooms really only once in its lifetime, near the end. So to watch one bloom, you'll have to wait from 30 to 80 years. But when it blooms, it is magnificent in God's timing. And you know, God may plan to use us in that way as we wait upon Him for one, one thing He wants to do that may have huge ramifications. You know, we think about the man who preached the night that Billy Graham got saved. And I could tell you his name, but I won't. But we, we don't remember him off the top of our heads, and most of you don't. I do because of stuff I read all the time and my background. But the thing about this is that this one night in this evangelist's life, he preached and a young boy got saved whom the Lord used to carry the gospel widely into the world and to see millions come to know Christ. And so, you know, we don't all know what all this uh, evangelist went through and waiting in his life, but God shaped him, prepared him, and, and raised him up for that moment. So God sometimes may want to use us in a great, powerful way in one moment, but God also may plan for us to bloom many times and in many ways, and I think that's more the norm that God wants to use us throughout our lives in a lot of different ways. And waiting plays into that with the various things he wants us to do. And so, again, the lesson from Anna and Simeon tonight then is that that often involves our learning to wait and to trust and to pray and to obey for his timing is perfect. His will is right. His plan for us is always for our good. So as we wait for Christmas to come here in a few weeks, and perhaps you feel right now that you're waiting and time is standing still. 
Well, just be reminded from this story tonight, trust God that all will unfold in His perfect time and way as you place your trust in Him. And so as we're about to celebrate Christmas, maybe that will be the greatest lesson for you this year uh, for your Christmas is for the Lord to minister to your heart in a time of waiting. So I just felt led to talk about this tonight and maybe the Lord wants to use it in a few lives out there who may be listening. I pray you'd have a great, great week ahead. Thank you for taking time to listen this evening. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you for your goodness and your wisdom and your power. We thank you, Lord, that you are Lord over every part of our lives, down to the very hairs of our head being numbered. And so, Lord, we know that you are in control. We get so flustered and, Lord, uh, anxious and uh, frustrated and waiting. But God, help us to learn from this great Christmas story tonight that you use that, Lord, and your plan and how you shape the world and shape us and use us and grow us. And so, Father, we just pray that you would uh, minister to our hearts tonight as uh, we may need it from this text, that we might, Lord, wait patiently upon the Lord and, uh, Lord, to allow you to do your great work in faith and obedience as we, Lord, continue to serve you. Thank you again for this time we've had together. I pray you would just bless everyone, Lord, who's listening in tonight, encourage them, and, Lord, just help them to feel deeply your great love. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.